and welcome to the Doofcast, the official variety podcast of doofmedia.com. My name is Scott Daly, and this is my co-host, Matt Freeman, the white thing with the yellow eyes. Yahtzee! <laughs> this week on the show, we are continuing our Deconstructing Director series with the ninth entry in our discussion of the films of M. Night Shyamalan, 2015's The Visit. This is the one, Matt, where everyone says, he's back! And we say, he never left. He never left. He never left, folks. He made a couple weird ones in there. He made one bad one in there. He never left. Yeah. So we're going to be talking all about the visit. It will be a full spoilers discussion about that movie. And then we are going to spend the last few minutes of our show talking about all the crazy Game of Thrones related news that we had this week. It was what it was a heck of a week for Game of Thrones and the Song of Ice and Fire world. Matt, yeah, we're gonna spend some time on that. Yeah, yeah, I think you're gonna have to catch me up partially. Um, I sure will. Sounds good. All right, let's get into it then, and let's talk about the visit. Bye, mom. My parents asked if their grandchildren could visit them for a week. Here we are. This is where our mom grew up. I wanted to spend time with you for so long. Miss you guys. <laughs> mom, we're having a great time. I have not seen your Nana this happy in years. <laughs> Bedtime here is 9.30. It's probably best you two shouldn't come out of your room after that. See you in the morning. 9.30? 9.30. What is that? It's 10.47. We think there's someone outside the door. So Matt, tell me about this movie. So this is Knight kind of uh, just trying to make a simple, scary movie. It's it's a found footage movie. Um, it's so, so. This is all of the. St- this is basically all of the stuff that he does. Right? It's got it's got sure. kids. It's got child actors. It's it's scary and creepy. It's got it's it's actually really about um, a family and and relationships and um, the the sorts of of really rather mundane tensions and dramas that occur in a family, but then of course it's wrapped up in this you know scary creepy story. Yeah, and um, yeah, it, it's it's just a, it's just a good solid scary movie, I think. Yeah. H- had you seen this film before you watched it for this project? I saw it once, and then when I was watching it again for this project, I f- almost felt like I hadn't seen it before. And, I, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and it gave me that feeling of like, either I really wasn't paying attention the first time, or it was just too long ago or something. I don't know. But um, definitely like the first part of the movie is you're just getting to know the characters. And I think maybe the first time I saw it, I, I was like, oh, this is boring. Um, I don't know why I would react that way, because... That's that's terrible. I should be ashamed of myself. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, had you seen it before? I had. Um, it had been a while, um, but I, I agree with you that watching it now, especially watching it in the context of the eight movies we talked about bef- leading up to this one, I definitely saw it in a different kind of light. Um, and a lot of people, as we hinted at at the beginning, are like, this is M. Night Shyamalan returning to who he is returning to his roots returning to his core and i think there is definitely a lot of that in this movie um obviously i disagree with the the idea that he hasn't been making good movies and then suddenly he makes a good movies but this this is very much him kind of going small and going back to what he did at the start um and and i liked after earth we talked about that movie i didn't like last airbender i liked the happening um i liked lady in the water these are all movies that that most people didn't like, but I would not, it would still be accurate to say those movies are a departure from what he was doing at the very beginning, from the first three movies he made. And the visit is definitely much closer in line with Unbreakable, with The Sixth Sense, and with Science than it is with After Earth, for example. Yeah. You know, if I had a complaint, if I had like a number one complaint about this movie, it would be that it's not as it's not nearly as ambitious as those were, um, especially with regard to the storytelling, like those, those movies, 
I, I really love the stuff that apparently everyone else doesn't like, which is, <laughs> which is like we like we weirdness. Like it's gonna be a weird kind of fairy tale story where maybe you're gonna have to watch it twice to really get in the right headspace to appreciate what he's trying to do with the movie. Um, we talked before about the idea that, um, like like everyone's first viewing of these movies, they're just expecting the wrong thing, partly due to trailers giving them the wrong impression, and maybe also partly just because when a movie is unlike anything else, you're almost guaranteed to walk in with the wrong impression. Um, this movie, you get pretty much what's in the trailer, actually. True. Um, it's, there, is a, there is a twist. There's a twist, of course, but it's it's not a twist that that's like, oh, it's, it's, it's not supernatural. It's not... Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think just to, to, to circle back around to what I was getting at, like it doesn't it's not trying to do anything particularly weird and that's fine of course um but i love it when he tries to do weird zany things so yeah i mean i i agree with that this is a this is as safe of a movie as i think knight can make yeah um and it's still kind of a weird movie which i think says a lot about him but it is it is very much like this is the smallest budget by far this is a five million dollar movie um no none of his movies have ever been that cheap um i I was wrong when i spoke last last episode where this was self-funded it wasn't um you can see right in the opening credits that uh jason blum and blumhouse uh helped finance this movie um i think so it is starting with his next two movies that will be entirely self-financed but um knight did put up some of his money for this movie not all of it though he didn't not all of that $5 million budget was his own money. But, um, yeah, it, it's small. But I, I think, you know, I, I agree with you that I, I like ambition and I like when he does weird shit. And I think there's plenty of room to talk about that in the next two movies after this one. But there is a part of me that sees a lot of sixth sense in this movie and just sees how I think this is a pretty tight script. I think it is doing a lot of things in the background that you won't necessarily pick up on the first time you watch it. Um, A lot of character work is going on in this movie. A a lot of what it's saying and what it's doing is, is like, it's not that it's subtle, but it's not thrown in your face either. So it is, it's a simple story. The characters aren't that complicated, but they're, they're well drawn and they're well fleshed out. And you kind of, as you sit there and watch it and you kind of realize, you, you know, you realize that both of these children have these kind of mental issues that cause them to behave in peculiar ways and how that reflects off of the two grandparents that they're dealing with that have mental issues that call them, cause them to behave in very peculiar ways. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's a fascinating journey through like, these kids who are suffering from heartbreak of their, their father abandoning them. Yeah. I find that that's almost always the case with his movies is the, the, the thing that actually tugs at your heartstrings and gets you is the, the personal plot, the, um, the, you know, the, the, the personal drama of, of the characters, which is sometimes only tangentially related to, yeah. to, to the big plot. I mean, it's not like the, the kids ultimately, ultimately are like i I think that the big the big heart-wrenching thing which only really comes into focus at the very end is the daughter thinks that she's seeking absolution and and peace and forgiveness and acceptance for her mother but she's actually seeking it for herself yeah and that's awesome and 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 it has nothing to do with the fact that her parents were murdered and replaced by crazy old people it's um it's it's just it's just the the emotional core of the movie and i mean yeah i and i and i love that if uh, another you know, i guess nitpick that i'd say is usually he does integrate it with the with the meta with, with, with like the horror movie plot better than he does here but i think it's fine actually i Maybe I'll, I'll retract that. I think I think it works fine. I think no, I, I, I think everything I think it's, put is put together pretty well in this. Yeah, I mean, I I totally yeah, I I hundred percent disagree that it's not. I think I think this this movie is about holding on to um to to anger and how it can destroy you and how it, it destroys your relationships and like I think there's a version of both Tyler and Becca in 
these crazy grandparents. Like I think the, the, the things, the ticks that they have, the mental issues that they're going through um, left untreated or, or galvanized by the anger that Becca feels towards her father, like warps into something that's even worse. And uh, I, I think that's her future. I mean, I think, I think a lot of what this is doing is showing that. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I saw that, but I actually like that because it's not like, um, we use, we throw the word crazy around. I mean, and, and that's yeah. kind of the easy way to describe what this movie is, is like, oh, they're crazy old people. Mm-hmm. But, but I do like this idea that like, especially the, the fake grandfather is, he he he's delusional clearly but also he's like um uh, he's kind of been destroyed by this belief that he's been persecuted yeah. and 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 that that everybody's out to get him and that's that's a separate issue from thinking that there's a creature it, it it's more to do with his relationship with other people i yeah i think that's interesting yeah, yeah. okay hey let's let's back up for a yeah. minute okay. and let's let's get broad with this because so I mean the basic the basic functionality of this movie is almost like a Hansel and Gretel remake. Uh, two kids are being sent by their mother to their grandparents' house for a week. Um, they haven't they've never met their grandparents. Her, their her mother left in a huff because she was in love with an older man, and so she's hasn't spoken with her parents in years and years and years. And so they're going to meet them, and they spend the week with their grandparents. And the movie. I think is paced very well and that things like just slowly ramp up to weirder and weirder and weirder um, until the incredible twist that I think works so well uh, where we learn those aren't, those aren't your grandparents. Yeah. Those are the, those are the people you've been staying with. Um, It's, it's really, it's really well done. Um, But yeah, as we've been kind of circling around this idea of um, anger and, and, guilt and um the 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 things we keep with ourselves um and how those things kind of destroy us yeah yeah so there's there's a whole bunch of different things to talk about in this though because this is like we said definitely m night going back to his roots um one of the things i wanted to talk about that we have to start with here especially when we're talking about directing and filmmaking is found footage as a technique because this is a found footage movie um and it's tech like that's become the term for the genre right but this is obviously not found footage because the end of these movies these characters are still alive it's not like someone found the tape somewhere and is playing it back that we are watching becca's completed documentary um becca the character is a filmmaker and the reason why she's filming this whole thing is because she's trying to help help her mother get over or help her mother rebond with her parents. And she's, she's going to film and make a documentary out of it. Um, and so that is why we have this found footage gimmick. I'll call it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of found footage movies, Matt. I think this is one of the best ones. I, I, I really do. I think Blair Witch Project, the first paranormal activity and the visit great found footage movies. Yeah, it's it's unobtrusive. Um, I I think this is one of the ones where I kind of sometimes forget that it's found footage, and then other times it's using the found footage nature in ways that um, are purely to its advantage, like the stuff where they leave the camera out to to watch what the grandmother's doing, um, the stuff where uh, like the the brother gets control of the camera. And or, or I guess there's there's two scenes where each of them is interviewing the other and they're asking questions that they've wanted to ask and they kind of are able to put their sibling on the spot and 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 push on them a little bit. Yeah, and, my my yeah. my favorite scene in the movie, honestly, is, is where they really they really push each other. Yeah, um, where he talks about the the football game that he froze at and we we learn what has what Shyamalan has cleverly set up in the background which is this girl has not looked at her face in a mirror the entire time yeah um, in this movie and and he makes that explicit and then of course I watch it multiple times in preparation for this so I was like did did they really do that and then you go back and watch and like yeah like there's the scene where she's specifically brushing her teeth where she's sitting in the bathroom facing away from the mirror and 
you don't think anything at the time, but then I think the attention to detail is certainly there, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah. So basically found footage, it works, it works really well. I mean, if you want to, I think like all Shyamalan movies, if you want to, if you want to be a pain in the ass about it, you can be like, it's not really realistic that they would be carrying the cameras around at the um, end of the movie. Yeah, and it's right. like, yeah, I don't care at all. Um, and I mean, I'll, I, I, I don't know. That's not even a, it's not even a credible complaint. Cause you can just be like, yeah, I don't know. They're panicking. So they're just grabbing things, whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't, I don't care about that complaint. I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, it's just like, okay, you, you got it. You, you got the movie. Yeah. So good, good one. Yeah. Right. So let me just write the realistic version of this in which they turn the cameras off and therefore you're not watching the movie anymore. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think the interesting thing about this and I think the, the interesting thing we, we, we've talked so much on the show about this idea that limitation breeds creativity, right? This idea that like you set yourself up where you, you can only do a certain thing a certain way and therefore that, that, that it takes this broad highway of ideas and forces you into one lane of traffic this and i think that's what found footage does and i think for Shyamalan in this case what it did was allowed him to really focus in on the type of filmmaking he likes to do because you you, you can't do a lot of crazy setups like right you can't do these massive overhead shots you can't do like swooping like single takes like that are that are clean like he tried to do with the action scenes in avatar you are forced to frame and build your movie around the fact that the camera is going to be a physical object in the physical space of your movie um and and i think that forces you to get creative and find ways to get you want to build a certain amount of motion you want to build certain tension um you have two cameras and each of those cameras have to be held by your two characters and that's what you've got to figure it out you got to figure out how to convey the things you want to convey using just that and i think he excels in that i think like it is such a a challenge in a way that i think based on these eight movies we watched before night was like, yes, I absolutely want to do this. I absolutely want to challenge myself in this way. I think that it, it, it's, it is really cool because you can see a lot of his signature techniques, but sure. Yeah. They're, they're translated through this, um, conceit of it being found footage. So, yeah. So whenever he has, you know, like there's a, you know, windows or door frames or, um, there, there's always a you can always buy that the camera has been set down on something or positioned such that it just so happens to be catching this shot um and yet the shot is very well composed in a way where i mean this you know this teenage girl is probably not talented to, to enough to literally have every single shot in her documentary be uh this well composed um but <laughs> but like who, who cares i mean the, the point is that it all it all looks really good um, like, like compare it to like Cloverfield or something where there are, there are large parts of Cloverfield where you're just like, I have a headache because <laughs> it's just shaking. And, um, th th that's one, I mean, th that movie is pretty fun too, actually, but that leans into the direction of like, it's a handheld cam. They're just running. It, it's, you know, th this movie really benefits from having this conceit where Becca is a, uh, she fancies herself a filmmaker, and so, and so, because of that, the movie is allowed to have all of this mannered um, scene, you know, the, these artistic shots and like, uh, you know, locations where they're choosing to have discussions and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see this wonderful moment where she's like pulling out a chair to put it in the middle of this like the dirt path. So she, that's where she's going to have her interview. And it, why is it there? It's because that's aesthetically pleasing for Becca. Um, another scene that jumps into my mind is when they, she first meets her grandparents, the camera, it, it's a, it's a wide shot. It's one of the few wide shots this movie has. And that's because Becca has set up the camera super far away yeah. <laughs> to get to, to really get this, this two sides coming together in the distance type of shot. Um, I think you're right. I think the idea of making Becca a, a, a filmmaker allows them to to compose a little bit more than they would i think one of the things that if you read or listen to them talk about cloverfield and the making of that movie one of the things that was very important to them was 
this guy is not a, a cameraman. He would not know the correct things to do with a camera. And so they worked really hard with the professional cameraman and the actor who was playing the guy that was supposed to be behind the camera to make it seem as shaky and terrible as possible. Where in that movie, like you're constantly missing a good shot of the monster because the guy <laughs> shooting this, the shot is bad. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I like, I like that idea. I think that idea specifically works for that movie. Right. What, what is going on here works really well for this movie. It, 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 you're absolutely right. It creates these, these Shyamalan shots, these kind of stationary, um, long takes or or like my, I think my favorite part was when he's interviewing Becca the brother's interviewing Becca and he's doing a, a slow rack zoom on her <laughs> like yeah. an emotion and she's like are you adjusting the focal length of the lens it's no like, what I don't know what no. that means um are you it's zooming just, in? yeah yeah it's just like almost taking Knight's technique and and putting them putting it in the world yeah um and yeah I think it does work really well I think there is there's a lot of a lot of fun he's having with this. And I think it creates one. Of, I mean, one of the other things is found footage. There's no soundtrack, right? Like music has been such an important part of I mean, in general, important part of setting the mood in film. Um, I think every single one of Knight's films have have been composed by Horner. Is that true? I think it's true. I'm not sure. Um, really good question, though. We should know that. Yeah, we should by by movie number eight. We really should know that. Um, but yeah, this movie can't because it's found footage. There there can't be a, a score and there isn't a score. So, again, that is limitations. That is you have to find a way to set the mood and to really key your audience in to the flavor of what you're going for without the crutch of music. So you have to do it with with angle you have to do it with editing um and i think it, it achieved that because i think this this is a funny movie when it wants to be funny it's a creepy movie when it wants to be creepy um i think it just really works all around i think and, so too um you know one thing that i remembered from the first time i watched it was like thinking that that some of the humor was cringy and then watching it this time i was like no this is just the way he is this is his sense of humor and like like in a lot of cases it's kind of it's like making fun of the kid but also the kid is is being earnest and so you're not it, it's an interesting combination i guess is what i'm saying it, it's it's a it's a fun very precise tone that he's going for and i think he's actually hitting it yeah. and and i think i was just misunderstanding what he was trying to do previously which i think is easy to do with Shyamalan movies actually um cuz like the, like he thinks he's this amazing rapper <laughs> and 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 like you're, you're sort of cringing at it but like the fact that he's so um devoted to it and like takes himself so seriously it brings like brings you through to the other side of like oh i kind of i, I admire this kid for for being this you know brave even though he yeah even though it's kind of ridiculous um i, I think that works really well i think that's a cool um technique and that is so night, right? Like yeah. the, 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 the concept of this little white kid who thinks he's a freestyler and it's like really, it's like his thing and it's, he's pretty bad and yeah. <laughs> ridiculous, but is like completely confident in himself. I, I think that is such night style of humor. Absolutely. And, and, and I get like, I think five years ago I would have been cringing at it too. And there were times watching this where I was like, oh geez, but <laughs> I, I, I do, I do think there's something delightful to it and the thing i love the most about it is becca who you know they spar like a brother and sister pair do but we never see her like chastise him for that specifically like she's never like insulting or mean to his rap in fact when it's around other people she's kind of encouraging like when her grandmother asks why why are you wearing baggy pants and he says well i'm a rapper and she jumps in and explains and yeah. she's being a little tongue in cheek, but she's never I mean, she never like interrupts him or like tells him this is actually terrible. Like she's never that level of mean to him. And I really like that. Me too. Yeah. They they consistently appreciate and support each other, actually. Yeah. And and then they'll just like the kind of offhand comments of like, God, I can't believe how stupid you are, but there's right. no venom behind it. It's it's just it's really just what it's just how siblings are um mm -hmm. 
And and I think that that's kind of the cool thing about about siblings in, in real life is they will needle each other endlessly until some actual threat comes up. And then they are, you know, they, they generally speaking, of course, um, <laughs> come together really quickly. And, and that's what you see happen in this movie. And it, yeah. work, it works really well. That, that's sure. that's one thing where the movie doesn't really make much like the, it's not like the, this is not a movie about their relationship and it's um, trials and tribulations. Right. That They have a pretty good relationship if anything, the development in their relationship is that they come to understand each other a little bit better and rely yeah. on each other a little bit more. But it's not like they didn't already somewhat. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, which is which is great. I, I like that. I'm not. Yeah, I like it a lot too. It's 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 really great. Um. So let's talk about old people. Yeah, <laughs> the horror element. <laughs> yeah. So so I mean, th- th- it's interesting, right? Because I think one of the things you and I were talking before we started recording, and one of the things you said to me was. The old people are just creepy from the beginning, right? Like, were we ever supposed to not be creeped out by them? And I think you're 100% right. I mean, I think what Knight does in this movie is kind of very, in a very controlled manner, like ratchet up the creepiness where it just, it starts off with something where you're just like, huh, that's kind of, that's different. And then it like really, really ratchets up. But I mean, I, I think a lot of a lot of what this movie is playing in is this central core idea to children that old people are kind of scary. Like they sometimes they behave differently than we're used to for whatever like dementia related old age thing they're suffering. Uh, sometimes they're just they they smell funny. They're they're weird. Um, they're just different, and they make kids uncomfortable a lot of times. And I think well, a lot of what the start of this movie is doing is playing into this like very kind of core um, young people afraid of old people adage that has existed in humanity for a while. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I, I like that it wasn't just an escalating series of weird things being noticed. I liked that it was actually they'd notice a really weird thing and then they would actually kind of nervously bring it up with with the uh, the crazy old people. And then and then they would have like a really uh, rational and sensible explanation for it of like, oh, he, you know, he, he's embarrassed of his accidents and he hides him in the shed. And 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 you, you know, as but uh, both the kid in the scene and you as the viewer are like, well, that's still kind of weird, but I guess yeah. that makes sense. Well, like or when the, or when the grandmother like is like running like a dog under the house, yeah. playing like chasing them hide and seek, and you're like, yeah, I mean that's weird, but. And you kind of I think the the actress who plays Becca does a really good job with this because there's this shot after they get out of there where she looks at the camera and just gives this look of like, okay, Uh Uh, and you can almost see her brain turn. She didn't say anything, but you can almost see her going from, okay, that's really, really weird. And then just going to like just going to like "Eh, old people. Yeah. Um, and, and that like that happens time and time again throughout this thing. It's just like just uh, well, it's just old people being old people. And I think it's this it's this fundamental fear. We I mean, I think it's related to this fear of getting old. Like you, you, you are creeped out by old people because old people are suffering from the consequences of old age. And that makes that that reminds you of your mortality that makes you uncomfortable. It creeps you out. Um, and night is playing into that for sure. sure. Yeah, there, there's a kind of uncertainty where you're like, I don't really know. Uh, what I'm dealing with here it's it's very I mean yeah. it's it's weirdly similar to like how a little kid reacts around like an, an animal where they're like I don't know are you gonna attack me or are we or are we cool and mm-hmm. it's the same level of not really knowing what's what's up I mean I remember playing like when I was I remember being really little and playing with old old people usually grandparents and, and just being like ah, you don't really know how to play do you Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's and that's uh, that's the funny thing about the about the grandmother running around under the house scene is like you could buy you could buy that she thinks she's playing with them and and that's just the way she thinks she's supposed to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, there, there's a lot of the movie that's that's kind of in that mode where it's creepy things that can be played off. And then there's and so one thing I love about it actually is that the the grandfather and the grandmother are are scary in very different ways. And and I think you were the one who pointed out that, yeah, you were the one who pointed out that like the grandfather, he's just chopping wood, chopping wood, chopping wood. And there's just an enormous, unbelievable pile of of chopped wood, (laughs) Um, which is, is, 
not something that I noticed at all because it's really, it's actually very subtle and you, you kind of have to think about it and its implications, but it's like he's just going through the motions, right? Um, yeah. And, and also an ax is a violent weapon. Later he's cleaning a gun. There's just kind of this edge to him of, of violence and tension. There's, there's the time when he attacks the guy. Um, he attacks the guy who he thinks is following them. So, so his, his scariness is like, this guy seems on edge and, 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 uh, and kind of out of it. Like he keeps doing the thing where he changes into his, his suit because he thinks he's going to a costume ball or whatever. Oh, uh, we need to talk about that scene when we get to it. I love that scene. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. Okay. But then I was just going to say the contrast is that the grandmother is, is frightening in a very different way where she has this kind of like calm, detached demeanor most of the time. And then there'll just be random things like, could you climb into the oven for me? Yeah, I, I think I think that's absolutely right. I think his the, the threat of his is that he will hurt you um, knowing that he's hurting you. Yeah. And she will hurt you like by accident almost I think because you're right. she's just she's just so out out there yeah um and, and I, I think you're right those are two very different kinds of fear but and and i love that the the movie takes the time to draw that them both and draw them differently and make these two unique characters and and the way they have to deal with these two unique characters differently yeah right and you know that's i think it really helps the the conclusion of the movie because it's almost like they're the um the the at least the grandparent that they end up facing is the one that they're I don't know suited to face. I, yeah, I mean, I think it, it it specifically ties into their own personal issues, right? Um, yeah. Like, I mean, it does it literally by the fact that the grandfather throws his poop diaper in the kid's face, and he's a germaphobe, um, and she's afraid to look into mirrors, and her grandmother literally smashes her into a mirror. Yeah. So these are like the movie is quite literally throwing their their issues into their faces literally their faces um but also I, I think there is something to um to this idea of the like they the type of the type of fear they represent is the type of um issues each of them are dealing with yeah i think you're right also just to add to your observation about smashing them in their faces i mean she she then she then kills the grandmother with the mirror yeah. Shard of mirror and yep. and he having frozen up and having to face his basically his his trauma of, of of freezing up and and being paralyzed by fear um he breaks out of that uh, yeah. and and so they you know they they both they both get their kind of um their face with the worst thing that they that they've had to deal with and then they overcome it yeah yeah i mean and and there's like i don't i don't know if i want to read too much into this but there's like that moment when he breaks out of his thing and then he's like screaming like the advice that the coach gave him about how to properly tackle it's kind of crazy like yeah. i mean there, there's some of some of the action of these children is not too far off of the action of their grandparents and and, and i wonder if there's a, a small commentary in here about how we parse the craziness of old people versus the the mental health issues of younger people um and how one we excuse a little bit more the other we are so uncomfortable with that we we ostracize them from the community you know yeah sure that's interesting i don't know i don't know if there's enough support for that in this movie like it doesn't go into that enough but i mean i especially the second time i was watching it there's these moments where you see them behave in a certain like like him freezing in this moment and just standing there for minutes as the grandfather just like kind of strolls around um I mean, we, there was a scene earlier in the movie where where the grandma froze like in place, like with her hand creepily raised and she's just frozen in place. And that comes off as terrifying. Um, and I just like that's, that's they're, they're both freezing. Right. So that is really interesting. Know. Yeah. I, I kind of want to go through and, and find if there's any more instances where one person, one, one character's kind of pathology is reflected by one of the, you know, one of the grandparents is reflected by one of the kids or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there's like a, a kind like a direct thematic connection between the grandmother drowning her kids and anything that's going on with, I, I mean, I mean, there's, the, there's a kind of obvious level on which it's like, well, she's sort of getting replacement kids. Sure. Um, I, I just don't know if there's anything other than that. Maybe I'm, maybe that's as far as I should look. I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's this idea that like she she drove away her child 
and is trying to reconnect with her child, right? Yeah. Um, the, in this case, she drove her child away by literally murdering her. Um, whereas the real grandmother, like they got into this big fight, this violent fight, and there's been this, this, this. I think like every character in the story seems to want connection back. Like they want, they want even even the bad guys want family. That's why they're doing this thing. They they want a family of their own. They want to experience that. Yeah. Um, and so they they just take it. So I mean, I I think it is related in the fact that we're all wanting. We've all made mistakes in our past. Some of them clearly worse than others, and we're desperately trying to reconnect with those people in any way possible. Sure. That that that's and the movie doesn't try extremely hard to humanize the grandparents, but it it does a little bit. I mean. It, it gives you enough information that you can sit back and say, well, these people sure have had shitty lives. Like mm -hmm. the, the old man is def definitely has, um, he's, he's delusional. He's paranoid. He, he, he certainly has some, some kind of dementia. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and maybe even, maybe even something more than dementia because it seemed like he was hallucinating things before he was elderly. I'm not sure about that. Maybe I'm misinterpreting. Um, and, and then, and then the the woman, I mean, presumably murdered her child when she was much younger, and was probably institutionalized for her whole life, and and has been, yeah, you know, basically reeling from this and and traumatized by this for her whole life. So, yeah. they, they're both just horribly sad cases. But it's the movie. The movie is not asking us to be sympathetic to them, really, because no, they're clearly they've clearly gone past the point where they're just violent and, and, and lashing out and hurting other people and yeah. they've killed multiple people by the end of the movie. So, um, uh, but, but at least, you know, like one, one thing I like is that they, they do kind of genuinely have each other's backs or at least, at least the man seems protective of the woman. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, like, I don't know how, what, like what relation, what their actual relationship is, you know, like, are they in love or do, like, are they actually a couple or does he just care about her and wants to give her what she wants, which is in this case to get to the planet where her children are. Um, I, maybe, I mean, I don't think there's any textual support for this, but I would kind of love it if they were siblings. Um, yeah, that would be, that would be nice. Wouldn't it? Like, like, yeah, but, uh, it, it doesn't quite work out plot wise, but I think it would. I mean, it's not that they need to be right. It's that you have a, a boy and a girl and a man and a woman and there's ample parallels to be made there already. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm doing the thing where I'm trying to relate their specific things back and I I'm trying to relate his incontinence to um, to Tyler's rapping freezing <laughs> no <laughs> to, uh, to his i mean specifically to his germophobia right yeah because he he's so embarrassed by by this thing that he's like hiding it and trying to burn it um but i mean also like he was so afraid in that moment in the football game that he froze and he sh shit his pants i, I don't know I, that might be a stretch but i mean i think there's something there lack of in control. the relation to that yeah well, yeah yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think there's there's a million little things where I'm like, what does the climbing into the oven thing mean? Like, I mean, besides just a Hansel and Gretel thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, w one of the things you, I think you see a lot is that these people are just going through the motions of existing on this farm. I mean, like we talked about the, the chopping wood. Um, she is just constantly cleaning the kitchen, like just constantly. Like there is no reason she cleans the oven like twice in the week that they're there. Yeah. I don't do that. Ever. But like once every <laughs> decade. Right. Yeah. And, <laughs> so, and, and she seems to always be cooking like, actually I, I didn't pay too much attention, but she's always cooking really kind of like, like desserts. Right. Am yeah, I wrong about that? Cook, yeah. Cookies and pretzels. And yeah, she's, she's, she's tr like, I mean, that's the kind of the tragic thing about this is this is clearly an unwell woman but she's trying to be an actual grandparent here. Like she's doing everything at the, at least at the beginning, at least like on the surface, she's doing everything you would expect your grandmother to do when you come visit your grandmother. Yeah. It seems like they're both trying really hard to actually sell this thing where yeah. they're, they actually want to give the kids a good weekend. Um, 
I wonder if they would have still tried to murder the kids at the end of the weekend if they hadn't been found out. I feel like that was always I feel like it was always the plan. I feel like she was going to give them their happy week. Then they were going to drown them in the um, the well, the well. And then they were going to kill themselves. Yeah, I think you're right. I I think that was always the plan because he was cleaning Um, the gun and everything. So, yeah. yeah. I was just cleaning it. Yeah. I was cleaning it. <laughs> oh, God. That was a great line reading, though. I mean, the the choice at that point, do we know that he's not the grandfather yet? I, I don't think we do. No, no, we don't. And like, it's such a different react. It's, it's such a reaction you would not think of. And I think that's one of the things that this movie does very, very smartly is the subtle ways it sets up the twist um, that you're not paying attention to. Right. I think we talked about the chopping wood thing, which like seems weird, but there was another scene where he's talking to his grandfather and he's just like tossing bales of hay out the window uh-huh. into the snow. And like, like there's so many scenes I, I've, I've watched so many movies where characters are on a farm and the, the, the dialogue of the scene is revolving around one of the characters doing farm labor, like where they're just picking up heavy shit and then moving uh-huh. it somewhere else. And, and I think, I think night is using your like, your ability to just Tune it accept out. that to 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 show it in front of you to trick you a little bit because like it's snowing out the horses are inside and he's throwing their food out the window into the wilderness and he throws three bales just casually and and like if you think about because it took me the second time watching it to really go like hey wait a minute <laughs> that doesn't make any sense why is he doing that? Why isn't he feeding the horses in the stall? Right. Like he should be picking up that hay bale, breaking it apart and dropping some of the hay into each stall. Um, <laughs> but he's not doing that. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because number one, you clearly know more about taking care of horses than I do. I mean, um, I don't really, I just know they eat hay. Yeah, <laughs> I guess, I guess that has to be true. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but like the thing, if, if, if we learn one thing about, night in the course of this it's that that's totally a kind of detail that he would pay attention to and do intentionally yeah, like yeah. there's no way that he's just like i don't know do some farm shit and let's just film it you know, like you no know, every every part of that is is designed um we, we've there's talked a, endlessly about the details that he puts in his movies so there's also this very quick flash to uh the the bulletin board they have on their wall that has the pictures of all the um the people that they help at the hospital yeah. And and he has very cleverly, but not obviously, left a space missing to where, like, you make the assumption that they've removed, like, the picture of themselves right. or, so, or something. Um, and it's 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 one of those things that, again, I don't think stands out to you until you've seen the movie and can go back and look at it. But that detail is there. Um, and I think it just helps support this idea that that he all this is planned and set up very slowly. Like, I, I, it's done there's two other characters that come into this movie, right? There's the, the one guy that works at the hospital and then the recovering addict that come by and they both introduce stuff very subtly. And, you know, I think we've talked about this in the past with, with how to give clues to your twists where you make the scene like do something like obvious and then also subtly setting up something else. Right. Uh Like, so, so this guy comes and he says, hey, your grandparents didn't show up at the hospital on on, sa- on Saturday. I've been worried about them because, you know, your grandmother, it seems like it's getting to her. And like on the surface, that scene is, oh, that kind of makes sense now. They are they have been slowly degrading over time and they've gotten to a point now where they're they're so bad they can't even do their the work that they were so proud of. And so like you kind of that that I think allows you to buy into the the this is why they're behaving strangely. But in the background, he's also setting up that the grandparents haven't been somewhere they were supposed to be. Um then he very subtly mentions like, oh there's been a lot of craziness over at the the hospital yeah um, which is something that's reiterated by another one of the characters right. and they never go into the detail of that but it's just like this the, this craziness at this hospital yeah i, I love um, i love that she's like yeah the scuttlebutt down at the hospital and, yeah. and it's like what a what a what a phrase to use because it's like that could mean anything <laughs> sure yeah. uh, in this case scuttlebutt means uh two of our prisoners that are murderers have escaped <laughs> and we can't find them yeah uh, yeah, no, I, I, I adore all that. I mean, I think maybe one of my favorite, um, 
shots in the movie is actually the very first shot where you see the grandparents where they're 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 standing with the kids and the expression on everyone's face is this kind of tense smile oh yeah and, yeah. and you can read it either as like uh like I, I really i really want this to go well i'm really nervous about this that uh, like like it's really important to me that this goes well and, and i'm excited to see these kids but i don't know what to expect um and, and likewise for the kids i'm excited to see my grandparents but i'm nervous or i hope they don't recognize that we're the wrong people and we <laughs> murdered their grandparents and so and so so like it's 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 really great in that it's just it's just like a, this smile is just on edge enough that you could buy it but also it works the second time too as being like yeah you, you can totally see that they're uh it, you, you almost read it completely different ways the first versus the second time and subsequent times you see the movie yeah i, I think you're right and and just the composition the framing of that shot is really good too because it's like it's it's becca and each grandparent mm -hmm. um isolated in frame it's presumably tyler's the one holding the camera i guess but it's like this is my grandpa blah 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 and yeah. this is and and yeah i think i think it's it's so great because it allows you it's it's a just it's simple frame so it allows you to focus on their faces and i think you your read on that is absolutely right there's this nervousness and i think the first time i saw it i did read that as just like i hope this goes well right we're really nervous about this but it it, it does have that that second meaning under there and it's so good. It's so good. There's also a point where um, when she brings up um, what happened between her mother and her grandmother and she like fl the grandmother flips out and then she says, I don't want to talk about uh, Loretta. I forget what her last name is, but in the moment that doesn't play as weird. Like, why would you say your daughter's full name? That seems like a weird thing to say. You're just kind of like huh and you just but you could just move on but in retrospect it's like oh because she wasn't talking about her daughter she's talking yeah. about this this woman that uh, these people that come and help her have have talked about on multiple occasions right and, and it's interesting because when she flips out it's it's actually for reasons that seem to make sense like 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 she's not completely so far gone that she's like on some level she's aware that she's going to be taking the, this woman's children away from her yeah. And so she's feeling some remorse about that maybe, but she, mm -hmm. she's also trying to, uh, I don't know. She's crazy, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, I, and I wonder like p part of me wondered if this was, a, if her reaction was specific to tell me what happened with your daughter. Right. Um, that and too. she's remembering the murders that she committed, not specifically the people that she's posed as. And, and that makes, that makes equal sense, right? Like it, yeah. pr pretty much every time she flips out, it's, it's a context where the character who she is would be upset by the things she's being asked yeah. um, in, in the way she's going to interpret it. Yeah. I think, I think one of my, the creepiest scenes to me, um, first we have her like, they, so they hide the camera in the corner and she pops up in front of it, which is just a fun little jump scare. Thanks for that night. Uh -huh. um, but then I think that that's not the scary part of the scene. The scary part of the scene is when she takes the camera with her almost to frame the shot of her pounding on the door with the knife. Right. And like the, the movie doesn't stop to explain why this woman is doing this. But I think, I think on her warped level, it's, she's been observing this woman, this, this teenager who cares so much about composition and framing and creation of the documentary. And I think on some warped level, it's like, well, I got to get you a good shot of this. <laughs> this is what you wanted to see. I got to get you a good shot of this. And I love that the movie doesn't have to like explain that. And you can just kind of reach your own conclusion, which I have happily done because it's such a weird off putting moment. Like she finds the camera, she picks it up, she brings it over there, sets it down to observe her pounding on the door with a knife in her hand. And then when she finishes, she goes and collects the camera and moves it back to where it was, which is just delightfully weird. Yeah. Uh, oh, man, I really like that idea that she's like participating in making the documentary even while she's doing that kind of thing because mm -hmm. even at the end when she's like stalking her around the dark room she's sort of going out of her way to make it cinematic <laughs> yeah she is she is i mean uh, she's and she's she's acting she's acting like a monster almost yeah. like she like the noises she makes this is the movie never goes supernatural but it's as close as it can there where she's not even acting like a human being anymore. Yeah. I mean, she's biting her and, and yeah. And yeah. 
yeah. crawling around on the floor. I mean, that's that's the part of the movie where if something supernatural is going to happen, you almost expect it to be there. But yeah, um, I yeah. also like I like the beat with her covering the the um, computer camera with with oven cleaner. Yeah. And that's and not great. just because she did it because it, it has it set up too. like night again, cleverly starts a scene with Tyler saying, yeah. And that's, um, that right there is the computer camera and yeah. that's what allows it. So like it establishes that he just told this woman what this thing is and now she knows what it is. And the next time we see her, she's cleverly found a way to, oops, we covered that up. I guess you can't see anymore. And I mean, there's something like, that's the interesting thing about these people is they, yes, they are mentally unhinged. Absolutely. But they are also very schemy. They, I mean, yeah. like, like her in particular, like, I don't think any of the things that they say about any of their symptoms are false. Like, I, I think she actually does sundown. Like, that is something that actually happens to her. Um, so, she, like, during the day, she has much more of her faculty, and she is schemy and smart and clever. Yeah, that's, um, man, that, that actually kind of, I want to watch the movie again now. Because, because <laughs> it, because it, I, I also, I mean, I honestly had this impression that the, the man was the, the brains of the operation, and he was kind of just bringing her with him as part of his thing. And now I, I kind of want to watch it with the lens that she's the brains of the operation. Uh, and he is just going along with it. Um, yeah. Because cl- I mean, clearly one of them planned this, right? Sure, sure. I, I think I think it's it's more supported that he is the brains. Um because it seems like he is doing this to give her what she wants. Yeah. But he does kind I, of I don't, monologue about it. So, yeah, I don't think she, I don't think he's the one that did the camera stuff. I think they made that like, yeah, they set that up for it to be something that she did because the kitchen is like her realm in the story. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you're, you're right about that. I mean, yeah, like, like he, he does. It's interesting because she's, she's like, practically nonverbal at the end of the movie of mm-hmm. course she is basically doing the thing where she sundowns and yeah and re- reverts um wh- whereas he is like mon- monologuing about like you know your grandparents deserve this because they bragged about having their grandkids come over yeah they shouldn't have done that um yeah the the, uh, the i never really liked you line oh, man. was brutal oh um and so, i think that ties yeah. into how he feels about his father right yeah like like he Th- that that goes back to this wonderful scene where his sister asks him, what do you feel about the th- fact that our dad left? And his idea was like, he was just casually like, oh, some people just, people just find something better and they go after that. And, and he, he just feels like his father found something better than him and, and chased after it. So like this man, this adult figure in his life saying, I never really liked you ties directly into the fear he has about his dad. I, I, I like that a whole bunch. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that makes that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So okay, I I wanted to wrap up on one thing with you, and this is this is where I start to speculate on our director, the most. Um, this is the least supported by anything other than my intuition and my understanding of who he is as a person based off his films. But we have Becca in this movie as a filmmaker. And especially at the beginning of the movie, she is framed as a super pretentious filmmaker, right? Like she's waxing on about the aesthetic and like the angles and like, like music choices. And, and the movie has framed this in a light of, oh my God, come on, like, come on. Uh, You're making a documentary about your parents. Like this is not going to win an Academy Award type thing. And part of me wondered if this is night in this movie where he is trying to get back to the basics, commenting on himself a little bit, commenting on maybe the ways in which he's lost his way in some of his previous movies. And, and this is a, this is an, this is an attempt at self critique and to get back to the core of what he does well, which is, you know, human intercharacter relationships. I I like it. Um, I mean, I, I I think that when a filmmaker makes a movie about a filmmaker, you 
you really should be asking yourself this kind of question. Yeah. Uh, almost any time a, a, film, a, film, a filmmaker or an artist makes a, a story about an artist, there has to be some level of autobiographical storytelling going on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, I'm just not, I, I'm not precisely sure what, what he's saying there uh, or, or what the, what the aim is there. But I, I do, I do like the idea that, um, because I mean, she's portrayed, yes, pretentiously, but also positively. Like, like he's not the film isn't making fun of her. I don't think for wanting to make this film serious. I mean, it, I guess it, it's it's making fun of her as much as you make fun of any teenager who takes themselves too seriously. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, but uh, she just happens to be a filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I don't, maybe like I said. I think this is a stretch, but I, I do find it I do find it a fascinating angle. And I don't know. I, I think I think there is something to be said. This this just this movie feels like he set out to do something small and core to himself. And in a movie where you set out to do something small and core to yourself and who you are and what you're interested in, um, it just seems interesting to have this person who kind of sounds like the M night Shyamalan that I read about in that book about lady in the water. Yeah. Like, like just a little bit, just a little bit. There. And I want, I, 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 I mean, I think one of the things I admire in artists a lot is when they have this ability to self critique where they like see their, the flaws in what they have been doing and, and the way they've been making their films and understanding on a certain level, why, why this movie critics loved but this movie critics hate and try to examine and and figure out what that is yeah and i don't know i don't know maybe I, maybe it's too much i mean i do i do love the notion that she just wants to make a simple movie about people and their relationships but then it turns into a horror movie <laughs> yeah that is true i do like that yeah um and she just kind of rolls with it and she, the movie she makes because we are watching her finished movie the movie she makes is this horror movie yeah yeah. So, so that that to me is kind of a him him being like I I just I I want to talk about this over here, but nobody would go see that movie. So <laughs> I had to put in ghosts and I had to put in a superhero uh, to make to make people care about it. Um, you know, just before we before we sign off on on that, um, we were just talking about the scene where you know he he says I, I never liked you and he and he smacks the diaper in his face, and if I'm not mistaken. That is a classic Shyamalan shot where the tops of their heads are cut off and you can't see their, their faces as they're talking to each other, right? That is correct, and, yes. there's, and there's a bunch of these in this movie, and it works especially well because it's found footage, and so there's this excuse for why the camera isn't pointing at their faces. Yeah, um, yeah. instead of just being a stylistic flourish, it is literally a limitation of, well, he didn't have the camera in his hand. It's back on the table that's behind them. right. But I just I love that that's it's almost like he he worked he worked his style or, or it's almost like he even he's kind of tipping his hand to this idea of like, yeah, this is this is the style that I've always been doing is is giving you the impression that you're you're just observing from some sixth point and you don't necessarily have a privileged position. You're not always going to get the best shot on the on this person's face because that's not that's not the, that's not what the camera has been that's not what the point of view has been in my movies yeah um it always makes it feel a little voyeury and that is uh -huh. i mean that is something that found footage always sp very specifically does right yeah because you, you literally feel like you're intruding <laughs> into someone's home movies um but i i i I, do, I think that that brings a realism to the world that Shyamalan has always had even when his movies have gotten very very other worldly yeah Except yeah. for Avatar, which is the exception to literally everything we're talking about here. Right. He's just not doing any of the same stuff there. Yeah. 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 Uh, so anything else you want to talk about this movie? I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I really like I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I think it's worth taking. If you haven't watched it in a while, everyone, I think it's worth taking another look at it because of all the fun things it's doing. Um, it's, it's tight. It's very smart. I wish I, I think there are some things that I wish were handled a little smoother. Um, I, I wish like things like the germophobia that was like brought up randomly and then didn't pay off till the 
the diaper in the face at the end. I, I just wish like those aspects of the characters were explored a little more. And I think that that's kind of a result of the, the like the problem with the gimmick of they're not really our parents or grandparents is they can't explore the relationship with their mother at all. Like the movie can't let them do that because they're, it's not really them. So mm-hmm. it has to, it has to like constantly like sh- shrug it off or move past it or have them dodge and weave past it. And that's fun in a certain way, but like the core of the movie is this relationship, right? The core of the movie is her mother and, and, her mother's relationship with her parents and how that is, has been damaged beyond repair as it turns out because of her actions, not because of their actions. And they can't really confront that directly ever until after the reveal. Um, and I think that's just a limitation of the structure of the story, but I, I would have liked to have seen that, that idea explored in a little more depth, but I just don't think, I just don't think it could have. Yeah. I I think a a lot of my feelings are kind of on, on the same order of, like i mean you mentioned the germophobia i i kind of think maybe that didn't even need to be in the movie i mean the diaper in the face is a really guttural upsetting moment but it's it's not super well set up so it's like either set it up better or do something else with that moment yeah um I mean, I think I think that the football one gets you where you need to go with that like I think the the goal in my in my conception of it is Knight wanted each of these kids to have some sort of mental issue. Yeah. He wanted them to have some sort of something, something there, there is something mentally messed up in these kids because of the trauma that they've gone through. And he, he wanted them to have that so he could use that to reflect off of the grandparents and what the grandparents are going through. Um, and, and I think in his mind, a specific kind of obsessive compulsive type of phobia is a lot easier to sell than the complex nature of like what the freezing thing looks like. Like, I think, I think if I'm writing the story, I'm just like, is that getting across what I'm trying to do enough that he froze in the moment? And like, he obviously like has like severe issues with this kind of stuff. Cause he's taking this and blaming his father's departure on this one moment that he's keyed in on in eight year old peewee football. Um, and, and maybe, maybe it's just like, I don't know if I'm getting it up. Let me put the germophobia stuff in too. That'll sell my, my, my point a lot easier because then I get to have the scene where he's literally freaking out about the fact that he has no tissues and he touched the, 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 uh, flusher on the toilet. Like, so I get to have that scene and that really sells this, this idea of they're losing it. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I I feel like that bit at the end there when he rushes him was sort of supposed to be the uh, swing away Meryl moment of the movie. Right. right. And while the swing away Meryl moment worked on me like gangbusters, uh, I don't know if it worked on everybody. And this moment in this movie didn't really work on me that well. Um, It it didn't, didn't take me out of the movie, but it, uh, I also didn't really have like much of a reaction to that specific moment. Yeah. I mean, I I think, I think you're right that if, if we're, if he's if he's trying to build these phobias or these issues that these children have as you know their thing to be overcome in the arc of their story i don't think those moments really land yeah because i don't i don't even think they really land for for becca either because like the you have to look at yourself in the mirror thing doesn't really pay off in a satisfying way because like I think it I think it would have been so much better in my opinion and again I don't want to I don't like rewriting things but like if looking in the mirror is what specifically allowed her to overcome the challenge yeah like if she saw something behind her in the mirror that she didn't use as a weapon something right. like that exactly it like or or looking in the mirror allows her to see her grandmother approaching her so she can like duck duck out of the attack or yeah, something like that right. where really she just opens her eyes and then her grandmother jumps her and, and like crushes her face into the mirror, um, which which I again, I like the I, got, I like the literal nature of that of that idea that we talked about earlier, that your issue is literally being thrown in your face. I like that a lot. But the overcoming of that thing, I felt like should have been more active where really it has nothing to do like she doesn't overcome her phobia of or her hatred of herself or her hatred of her looks 
to defeat her grandmother. It has nothing to do with that. Yeah, right. It's um, I I think I think what both of us are kind of expressing is like we feel like it could have been a little bit tighter, but um, I think I think both I think I don't know speaking for myself, I still really like the ending. It, it, it's upsetting. Oh, it's yeah, disturbing. It's scary. It's creepy. Uh, it works on all those levels. What it doesn't do is it doesn't give me that like frisson uh, that I that I almost expect <laughs> from, from a Shyamalan movie, which really is a compliment to how much I like most of his movies. Um, it's yeah. it's it's just like yeah, that was that was creepy, and then they escape. I mean, to, to, to speak to the terms that are used in the movie, the denouement of the movie is not as satisfying as it, it could be. Yes, it, it yeah. doesn't tie everything together right there are there are moments there are things that tie together perfectly that that come to fruition like the moment when her mother tells her don't blame your father don't don't keep that hatred inside of you don't do that and then we see we cut immediately to footage of them as children um with their dad which she specifically said earlier in the movie that she would never do because putting footage of him in her movie meant he she would be forgiving him and so that's basically the movie saying she has forgiven him yeah mwah, mwah, love it it's yeah. beautiful but it, yeah there's there's all these other strands that i wish could be tied up into that and i think a movie like the sixth sense a movie like signs a movie like unbreakable just did that like everything came together perfectly in the end there were no loose threads there were no story elements that didn't matter to this to the overarching plot of the story um and this just has a few a few little shaggy ones yeah yeah right so our, our basically our verdict is not perfect not a, not a masterpiece yeah right <laughs> very good <laughs> yeah yeah um, i mean this is not one of my favorite of his movies uh, i'll say that it, it ranks yeah. it ranks fairly far down but that's only because i really 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 like so many of his movies yeah i um, agree yeah i totally agree all right so that is the visit next time on deconstructing Shyamalan, we will be talking about the movie that truly made everyone say he's back baby <laughs> we're going to be talking about Oh my god! I just blanked on the name of it. What is the name Split? of that movie? Split. Thank you. The Jeez. one that I haven't seen. Yeah, uh, the one. The, the one, one of the two. Of, yeah. We're now we're now officially and Matt hasn't seen these territory. The next two movies Matt has not seen. So we've got two movies to go, and it's going to be new for both of you for on both of them for you. Yeah. So I am very excited. I it's been a while since I revisited Split, and I haven't seen Glass since I watched it in the theaters. So it's going to be a lot of fun revisiting these two with you. Home yeah. stretch. Yeah, I've been saving him up for this. So, let's talk about Game of Thrones. Okay, what a week for Game of Thrones! You're, you are going to have to catch me up because I saw. Sure. I've seen a couple of things, almost contradictory seeming things, and then there was this tweet thread we wanted to talk about um, from yeah, this so Austin Film Festival Q and A. We'll start with the news. Okay. Um, and then we'll go back to the film festival Q&A because I think that's the part we want to focus on the most. OK, uh, the news this week. I mean, first of all, not Game of Thrones related, but related to Benioff and Vice. Uh, they have left their Star Wars trilogy. Remember, I think it was last year it was announced they were going to be creating a Star Wars trilogy, a trilogy of movies into the future. Um, they're not doing that no more. And it came the day after this Austin Film Festival Q&A. And so a lot of people were like, oh, I wonder if that went over so badly that, <laughs> that they're off of the Star Wars now. Uh, that's not how this industry works, folks. <laughs> it, it, that that decision was decided months ago and it was just announced today. So, no, it had nothing to do with how terrible they looked at that Q&A. <laughs> um, but more uh, on that later. They did, though. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Uh, then on Tuesday, HBO announced that they were not going forward with the Naomi Watts led prequel series on Game of Thrones that is supposed to be set thousands of years before the events of the show. Um, this actually the pilot of this was filmed. It was filmed. It was edited. It was completed. They sent it to HBO and they said, nah, not doing that. So that's that one's dead. But then later that day, almost as if they realized that by canceling that prequel, everyone was like, oh, my God, HBO is getting out of the Game of Thrones business. And and the channel was like, no, 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 no. We're still doing stuff. They announced that they are moving forward and they have ordered to series a prequel series called House of the Dragon, which is going to be set 300 years before the events of Game of Thrones. This is apparently going to be Aegon's conquest. And apparently 
the plan is to lead all the way up to the Dance of the Dragons, the big civil war in the Targaryen family. So uh, that's definitely happening. So so look forward to it. So basically they said, all right, what else has George written? They said, oh, OK, <laughs> Fire and Blood, the 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 um, the the what, what's it called? The fake history or whatever. Yeah. Which, which yeah. I'm reading, by the way. Uh, just just only make things that he's actually written from now on. Yeah. Uh, and that's what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting to see. I, I think at one point there were five pilots scripts floating around in HBO that they said they were interested in making in the Game of Thrones universe. And uh, as far as I know, we have been reduced to just the one, just this one. So That's, I mean, I, w- I would kind of expect them to put their eggs in one basket, right? Like, sure, sure. There's not. I mean, p- people are kind of ambivalent enough about Game of Thrones that I, I really wouldn't. Uh, strain our patience by giving us a bunch of different options yeah and, and and to a certain extent this is kind of just how tv production works right you green light a bunch of pilots and then you take a look at the pilot and see do we think this is going to work as a show and if not you say okay thanks we're not going to pick you up which is exactly what happened with that with that one prequel but not the other prequel yeah makes sense yeah All right, now let's move on to the main event. Let's talk about this Twitter thread. So the background here is the Austin Film Festival happened this weekend, and Benioff and Vice uh, were doing a QA and a there. And uh, this person named Needle and Pen, at 4Arya on Twitter, uh, was there, and they captured basically the entire Q&A in a series of tweets. And... It didn't go super well for the, for the boys. Yeah, they they seem to have lost all sense of, um, well, maybe they never had it. Uh, j- just an ability to control how they appear. They yeah. just look terrible. They, they say yeah. things where you're just like, "That's." I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think of a specific thing so that I'm not just. I, I, we need to give people something to to latch onto if they if they're not familiar with this, but. Um, they just kind of talk about the fact that like they didn't have a writer's room. It was just kind of the two of them writing episodes. I guess this is after they ran out of George material or maybe I even think it before was the it. Whole, no, it was the whole time. They never had a writer's room. They never had a writer's whole, room. They just serious. Cause I, I, cause I know George wrote at least a couple of episodes, right? Yeah. But I mean, that's like, so here's, for those that don't know, and I'm not an expert of TV development, but I, I spent way too much time reading about it. Basically, the concept of a writer's room is you get a bunch of writers together and then you break stories together. So it's like, all right, episode one dot four. What are we going to happen? What do we want to happen in this episode? What are we going to do? And you break the story together. And then normally one person then takes that broken story outline, goes off into their office, punches out the episode, actually writes the script for the episode. uh, And then everyone else will read it and give notes and go through that whole process. Um that did not exist on this show. Uh, it, it did not exist at all. So yes, other people wrote episodes, but it was not that kind of communal process. It was literally just, okay, George, you write this episode. Okay. You write this episode. We're going to write these episodes. That, that is the, that's the way it happened. I mean, even like the West wing had a writer's room, like even a show where, uh, Aaron Sorkin wrote every single episode himself until he left the show still had a, a staff, of writers to help him break the episode before he went and penned it himself. But um, yeah, in this tweet thread, they say they didn't have one because they didn't know they were supposed supposed to. Yeah. They, they they never, I guess they never talked to anyone. I think another (laughs) one of the more grading aspects of, of the the whole thing is they're just like, um, we didn't pay any attention to how the show was being received. Yeah. And, and and like one of them was like, no, I, I, I literally never, uh, never, paid any attention to how the show was being received and the other one was like yeah i looked i looked it up once and uh and it was upsetting so i so i never looked at it again and it's like okay yeah i mean like here's the thing about that like i i think i think a lot of fan feedback is actually fairly useless for a creator like i i don't think anyone like, I don't want M. Night Shyamalan to listen to this podcast. <laughs> like, I, I really I really don't. I don't think that I don't think anything we are saying about his movies should go into his head and and change how he designs movies. So I'm OK with them not really paying attention to feedback from fans, because like 
by the time something theoretically, by the time something has been pushed and is out for consumption in the world, they've gotten notes and feedback from hundreds of people in the industry. Like people have picked over this thing and given notes and and critique and that kind of stuff already. So I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to admonish them for not caring about that because I, I don't think I would want to. I do feel like the fact that I, I I'm I'm I guess I'm I guess I don't know how I feel about this because the show is popular and beloved and great up until they ran out of George material. And then they they really should have, have said like, all right, we don't know we're we're not as good as George R. R. Martin. We should know that because we're because because he's he's amazing and but so so we need to get we need to get people to help us with the writing part. Sure. And yeah. then and then when when they didn't do that and then they started getting like almost immediately much more negative feedback, they should have been like that they should have reacted to that. They should have been like, okay. I I actually agree with you that generally speaking, the average person the average person's specific feedback about what they did and didn't like about something is not very useful. Um but the fact that they hated it is useful, you know, like the fact that the fact sure. that drastically the fact that fewer people are watching it, the fact that people are just the, the general sentiment around it has has degraded severely. Um, I, I, I sort of can't understand how they could. I don't know. I don't mean this to turn into the ranting about Game of Thrones hour, but like I can't understand how they could watch the show that they were making and be like, yep, this is just as good as it was in <laughs> season one and two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the main problem with this tweet thread is almost not even the content of what they're saying. I think it's how they said it. Yeah. And I and I think again, we're we're listening to this through someone's transcribing, so we have no kind of actual ability to tell how they said, like how they form the phrases, the tone of which they spoke here. But it comes off as if they are attempting to be self-deprecating. They are attempting to admonish themselves for not knowing what they're doing for for they basically said that the show was film school for them that they just had no idea what they were doing like i don't know how to work with a costume department how do we do that i don't know and and while i understand and appreciate that because i think a lot of this this industry is a learn by doing type of thing what it does is come off as like it just makes it seem like well why the fuck were these two the jokels like <laughs> put in charge of this thing? Like I, I just like what what why 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 did that happen? Like why if you admit jokingly that you didn't really have a good grasp of the character, why didn't you do something about that? Like you you couldn't you have? <laughs> Like, yeah, we, we really didn't get the characters. It took us a long time to get the characters. And, and the only reason we got our hands around the characters eventually was because HBO ordered additional minutes onto the scenes because our episodes were only about 39 minutes. Like, they didn't have a scene with Robert and Cersei in the show until HBO told them that they needed more minutes on in the episodes to, to comply with um, contractual obligations. Because yeah. the episodes weren't long enough and they had contractual agreements to do. And the Robert and Cersei scene in the first season is like one of the best moments in that season. It's so good. It's so good. And like that that wasn't planned. There's a lot of stuff. It's like, well, how did you approach like the overall concept of the story? And they're like, you yeah, we we didn't. Um, we just kind of took it, you know, bit by bit and just kind of winged it and it's just like that's not a good look guys yeah and again and again i i think i think what they're doing is they're trying to say to people look we get it like we're taking responsibility for this you didn't like it it's my fault but the way in which they're doing that is only making people more annoyed yeah um I think that one of the words used in this article discussing it is tone deaf. And um, that's, <laughs> that, that's definitely how it comes across. Yeah. Um, 
D- I, did you did you really sit down and try to boil the elements of the books down? Did you really try to understand its major elements? No, we didn't. The scope was too big. I, I don't even know how, what that means. How do you? Yeah. How do you not, how do you adapt a story without trying to understand the elements of the I, story? I, I feel like the scope is too big is like a non sequitur. It's like yeah, the scope. Like you mean the number? What, what what do you mean by scope exactly? Like the fact that it covers a lot of different settings. Or, it, it's it's not that many characters. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. it's uh, it's re- it's it's really really not that many characters it's not that i don't know i i feel like i think the the most the most offensive thing to me as a as a big fan of the books is like i feel like they didn't actually appreciate the source material that they were getting i feel like they were like yeah this th- this seems cool it's got incest people pe- people will think that's pretty fucked up mm-hmm. um and they didn't really appreciate that these are you know literature actually yeah um and they just wanted to kind of make a pulpy um sex and violence tv show about it and then they lucked out because the the great story that is in this that is in these books carried through to the screen until it didn't anymore and then they just had the pulpy sex and violence which they thought was what everyone was there for Mm -hmm. and they were wrong about that and i i kind of don't even know if they realize that that is what happened yeah i don't know and look here here's what i don't want to do and maybe saying this at the end of this is too little too late (laughs) I think there's been this this hate train for these guys that has gone like high speed since the end of that show. Yeah. And I think that's over that's overblown. Like they're two guys that made a bad thing. It wasn't it wasn't very good. Making good TV is really hard. It's super hard. Most TV is bad. Let's just say that. Most TV is bad. Um and so it's not like the most ridiculous thing in the world that these guys made a bad tv show and i hopefully they'll learn from it i think they are talented in it i think they are talented in some ways like look like as you said the first part of the show is good and even with as little understanding of the content as they seem they have they put together them and their team that they put together managed to do some pretty impressive things yeah. there was nothing like the show that existed in the world and they did it. So I, I don't th- like I don't think we have to like hate these guys now just because the last four seasons or just one season, if you ask some people that are wrong, um, were bad. It just I, I, I it drives me crazy. And and one of the things I, I saw after this thread went crazy viral on Twitter this weekend is people just like just like ragging, like just being nasty. And it's just it's not it's not worth it. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, um, I, I agree with you. Uh, and while being fully aware that I just like unloaded on, <laughs> on, on these two guys who are never going to hear me or care or know who I am, um, uh, th- there's frustration. There's frustration that, that arises when you feel like storytellers have, have, have let you down. And, and may- maybe that's completely unfair and ridiculous. And I'm actually kind of willing to examine whether that's unfair and ridiculous uh, yeah, but yeah. but i do feel it regardless no and i think it's i think it's absolutely fair to feel frustrated it's absolutely feel, fair to feel angry i think when someone comes in and and in in all seriousness attempts to be self-deprecating but it just comes off as kind of laissez-faire like i didn't get we didn't we yeah we didn't give a shit yeah that's what it, that's what it comes off as kind of it, it kind of does I, yeah and, and i get feeling frustrated with that Totally. I'm not telling people they shouldn't be mad at these guys for the show that they ran. But I think it ha- you, we have to draw a line somewhere. Right. And just be like, like. You can't celebrate like I I don't want to celebrate their failure like there this this thread came out and then they were off Star Wars and everyone's like, ah, oh, yes. Uh, and I don't know, just like, let's see what they make next. And if it's bad. Okay, if it's good, awesome. Like these guys have done other th- they did other stuff before this show. Uh I think is it Benioff that wrote the book? I think Benioff wrote The 25th Hour, which I have not read, but as I hear is a, a pretty good book. I mean, they they have talents. They, like as much as this industry is very much like a who you know type of thing, you also have to be able to do some stuff. So, I don't know. 
I don't I don't know. I don't know how to wrap this up in in a satisfactory way other than to say uh, they need to have their publicist with them when yeah. they do Q&A's like right. this. Well, I, I feel like I, I, what I would take away from it is just like tr- try to try, try to learn something from it. And what I would learn is, um, well, maybe I'm not learning anything because it's reinforcing something they already believed. But but just like the idea that you're going to not have writers you're you're going to be the showrunners who do who are basically the 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 doing everything people and you're going to write all the episodes and you're not going to really have anybody to bounce ideas off of yeah and 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 you have George R R Martin over here this genius being like oh oh you're making that change <laughs> i don't um i don't know if that's wise and then you're just like yeah yeah but look it's it's simpler this way and then him him be, i mean i remember this happening where the one of the first kind of deviations they made from the story and and martin had a comment that was like you know these things snowball you make one little change here it seems small <laughs> and then you realize later on like oh that character was supposed to be here i needed him to do this there and 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 now the whole story is derailed and um and that that was seasons ago that was that mm-hmm. was that was pretty much immediately after they, they took over and um, yeah. it just got worse and worse and worse. And then they stopped even trying and they stopped even consulting him. And, and the, the lesson is like, you, you got to pay attention to, to the writing. It's, it's super detail oriented, super that the, there's a reason he takes years and years to write these books. They're incredibly intricate little clockwork yeah. puzzle things. And the, just the, the arrogance it yeah. is is something where i think if we're gonna again i'm trying to i'm, try, I'm trying to wind it down but the the lesson that i would take is like man like like appreciate the difficulty of of what it is you're trying to do at least yeah i th- I think one of the other things is if you don't want to do it anymore leave uh-huh like i think it's very clear these last few years they were kind of tired of doing the show yeah and they just wanted to wrap it up and leave the show if you don't want to do the show anymore leave the show i know it's your baby but to go back to Aaron Sorkin, he left the West Wing when he didn't want to do it anymore. He didn't like the direction they were going. He didn't like what the the network was making him do, and he didn't want to do it anymore. So instead of just like writing it out in and just like trying to get it done as quickly as possible, he just said, "Okay, I'm gonna go." Like yeah. they should have left if they didn't want to do the show anymore. Just leave. Yeah. So when we uh, run our own show, Matt, uh-huh. uh, we will have a writers' room. Yeah. Uh, don't be arrogant. Yep. Uh, leave the show if we don't want to work on it anymore. Okay. And uh, that's pretty much it. There All right. Go. Sounds uh, good. That's a uh, that's been how to run a show by Scott and Matt. Yep. Two people you're, that have definitely never done that. You're you're welcome, everyone. <laughs> All right, guys, that is all we have for you this week. If you have any opinions on anything we talked about today, feel free to reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or on Twitter at doofmedia. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what you thought about that tweet thread. We want to hear what you thought about uh, this Game of Thrones news. And if you watched The Visit, did you like it? Did you like it? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? If you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, pretty much any podcasting platform. Yes, and you can find all the content we make over at our website, doofmedia.com. That's where you can find Deep Impact, We've Got Worm, Do the Right Thing, Mm, What You Say, This Show. Did I miss any? Media. I don't even remember. Um, there, we got so much content. Just head on over there. Doofmedia.com slash podcasts. You can see the whole list of them and you can say, I want to listen to that one. Yeah. You know, there's this web serial called Worm, actually, that that it's been out for oh, a few years. Um, I, I actually really liked it. Um, Scott, did you, um, you you read Worm, right? Yeah, I read that. I, you know, honestly, <laughs> didn't didn't really care for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right well uh anyway um that's cool it's a, it's a joke because i obviously i did yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I did just, just literally a hundred hours yeah, and, yeah um we did a podcast <laughs> on it though is is how that was that segue was kind of supposed to go but i like well, the direction that you yeah. took it I was, Some, sometimes I was, sometimes i forget that while the majority of our listeners are crossovers from that show yeah not all of them. Not are. All of them. That's that, that was that was kind of where I was going with that. But um, yeah, I wanted to well, yes I, I, and your your saying you didn't like it though. So oh, um, okay, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, if you want to support us, though, even after that terrible joke we just made, you can uh, become a patron of Doof Media. Head on over to patreon.com slash Doof Media and l- leave us pledge a dollar a month. I fucked that up, but give us money yeah, and we'll put, be happy. Put some money in the tip jar. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it Every little cent you send us helps us keep the lights on, helps us pay for this equipment, um, helps us out. So we appreciate all of our patrons. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, also, please consider leaving us a rating or a review over on Apple Podcasts or any of those other app things that accept ratings and reviews. <laughs> there's a there, it's it's a confusing world out there. I don't even it know. It sure is. But if you have if you see a thing and it gives you the option to leave a rating or a review, maybe maybe do that. Every review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the stuff that we make here. Yeah. All right, guys, we will see you next week with another exciting episode. We're going to be talking about She-Ra. All right. Shara. She, Shura. Shara. Shara. Sharon. 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 It's this exciting new Netflix show called Sharon. And you'll do what I say. Woo, woo. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woo.